let's get to the reason we're all here tonight. We're here to talk about, you know, how to get your first PM job and grow your product career. And I'm super excited to have um, two experts on this topic here. I'm going to moderate our discussion, but I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. We have Jackie Bavaro, who, as I mentioned, wrote the, the best-selling book, co-wrote it with Gail, Cracking the PM Interview, as well as the newest book, Cracking the PM Career, which is what we gave away today. Um, Jackie was product, they call it program management at Microsoft, but it's product at Microsoft at Google and product head of product management at Asana. Well, she's no longer there, but she was a head of product management there. And Carlos is the author of the product books, which I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with. And he's the CEO of Product School, which I'm also guessing a lot of you are familiar with. So um, Carlos and Jackie, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> All right, cool. So I thought we'd just quickly start out rather than me introducing, if you could just do a quick introduction of yourselves, um, just like in short, like, hey, you know, what are you doing now? And just a quick summary of your background so the audience can get to know you. Jackie, you want to start us off, please? Sure. All so right. I, uh, I've been doing products since, I guess, 2002, maybe? It was when I got my first internship at Microsoft. Um, and I got kind of just like pushed into the job. Like I had no idea what I was applying for. And my friend was like, just go to the interview. And at the interview, I tried to like figure out what the job itself was. Um, and so from there, I went to Microsoft full time. And when I was moving across the country, decided to apply to Google. And um, so I applied to Google, got my first two phone interviews and got rejected. <laughs> And um, turned out at the time, I thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen, but it, it turned out to be, you know, inspiration for the rest of my career. So a year later, I applied again, and that's when I got into Google for full time at the APM program. And I was at Google for three years when I ended up joining Asana. Um, I got recruited over there by an engineer I'd worked with back at Microsoft. So uh, that, that connection ended up being really helpful. And I was at Asana for over eight and eight, over, over eight years, um, just got to like kind of grow with the company. You know, that's where I became a manager. That's where I hired up a team. That's where, you know, I, I got to learn and practice and, and see all of these things. And that's also where I was when I wrote uh, the first book. And, uh, and then I decided in 2019, right before the pandemic to, uh, to leave for a little while, try something new. That's when I wrote the second book. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much, Carlos. Yes, and by the way, Jackie, I'm a very early adopter of Asana. I think I uh, used it in 2010 when it was still in beta. So uh, I have an Asana T-shirt. So uh, I've been I've been building products before I knew what product management was. That's the paradox of it. I come from an engineering background. I'm originally from Spain, and I always enjoyed this building things. However, soon enough, I realized that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life coding. And I had no idea about my options. I didn't know how to leverage my background in, in a different way. Product management wasn't cool. So I decided to come to the Bay Area, uh, business school. And funny enough, business school wasn't a solution either because there wasn't a single class on product management or digital marketing or data analytics or any of the digital skills that a lot of us use on a daily basis. However, at least I started hearing the term product management. And these are the new cool kids because they're making new decisions. And this, that. I mean, I was so confused. I just realized that I could work in tech without being an, without coding. I was like, okay, this sounds like me a little bit. So I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've built three companies and I learned pretty much on the street. I was um, lucky enough to join different accelerator programs like 500 Startups. That's actually how I got in touch with them many years ago. I got access to incredible mentors like product managers from Google, Microsoft, and other companies. And, and that was so inspirational for me that eventually I realized that I wanted to create uh, the school of my dreams, the school that I never had, basically, which is a, a hybrid in between engineering and business school. And that uh, it's called product school, obviously. Uh, so seven, I started the company seven years ago, fully bootstrapped. Seven years later, we had a community with over 1 million members. That means that a lot of people who care about product. And we also recently announced our funding round of uh, $25 million, which is very validating for, for all of us to know that there's, there's a market for, for people who want to continue growing their careers in product. 
And kind of the, the secret sauce of what makes us unique is that our instructors, they are not teachers. They are amazing product leaders like Jackie, Dan, and, and others who work at really cool companies. And while they keep their jobs there, they also give back to the community. And, and that's something that personally as a, as a student resonates with me because when I was a traditional student, I didn't want to be like most of my teachers. And when I go to product school, I really want to learn from, from the best. Awesome. Yeah. I think you recently on LinkedIn or Twitter, you said something like there are a lot of product managers who don't realize they're product managers, right? Sounds like that was right. you as an engineer. And that was me too. Real quick about mine. I won't say what year I started because it's a little before 2002, but um, I moved out to go to business school out here. I was fortunate to get into Stanford. That's what brought me to the Bay Area for business school. But before business school, I worked on submarine design and my title was engineer. I was doing like mechanical engineering stuff. And then in business school, trying to figure out what I want to do after graduation um, I discovered product management. I learned uh, into it. You know, I remember they had this company presentation. It's 1 PM was like jumping all around talking about how great it was. And I'm like, that sounds cool. And exactly what you said. I was like, I got to work with the developers, but I'm not going to build it myself. Then as soon as I started doing job, I'm like, I was kind of doing this in the submarine world. It's just very, very technical. So anyway, awesome. Cool. So that's everyone's story. Thanks for introducing The One thing I, I, I want to talk about is like, PM has gotten pretty hot in the last several years. It's kind of crazy. Like when I joined, it was like this, you know, Intuit had a PM and Yahoo had producers, but there wasn't a lot of things. And now it's like the hottest job. So I just would love to hear, you know, Carlos, maybe starting with you, like what, what's going on? What, how, how hot is it? Why is it suddenly got hot in the last several years? Like what's going on? Look, when I started product school seven years ago, a lot of people would be like, well, is this a coding bootcamp? Because that was the boom where yeah. the, the schools were promising a coding job. And there were a lot of questions around it. But do I need an MBA? What is this really? Do, why do we need a product? Is this project management? Right, right. Seven years forward, we're in a whole different space. Like we, we see people coming saying, hey, I've done my research. I want to be a PM. Now it's more about what type of PM I want to be, what type of companies, and, and so, so forth and so on. Well, we've been building uh, an annual report called The Future of Product, where we try to get that answer, not just from me, but from a ton of different product right. leaders. And there's some macro trends that are kind of pushing in, in this direction. One, obviously, is the is that more companies than ever are offering their products or services online, and they're also embracing remote work. So every single company, even if it's in tech or not, even if it's in Silicon Valley or not, is using some sort of software. And that means that if you're using software, you can't just rely on software engineers. Eventually, you're going to need someone who is not a software engineer who's going to try to, to help coordinate those efforts. And, and that happens to be called product manager today. Actually, I think that the concept is not really that new because like, if you look back in the day, maybe that was called brand manager in the consumer sure. packaged goods or, or others. But now, since now every company is a software company and the, the, the word product manager became much more mainstream which I think it's, it's a good validation for all of us, right? There's another macro trend that's happening, which is companies are actually investing in, in product, not just at the entry level, but at the top. Like we are seeing the rise of the chief product officer or the VP of product or the head of product, right? but there's someone at the table who is not under marketing or under technology. They are at the same level reporting to CEO. And ultimately we see many, many CEOs who come from a product background, who call themselves product people or builders. So all of it is, is really pushing in, in that direction. And from a student standpoint, which is the, where we spend most of our time, we don't have enough um, supply, meaning there's more, and there are more companies hiring PMs right now than actual PMs, which I, I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's funny. In the old days, the debate was the blog posts are always like, should PM report into engineering or marketing? And as you said, it's, I'm glad we don't have debating that anymore. Like the VP... The head of product, whether it's a VP or CPO, often reports to this, the CEO and is at a seat at the table. How about you, Jack? I'm sure you see a lot of new PMs with your book, Reaching UMP. What are you? What's your take on the last several years and why it's kind of gotten so big? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have any, any. I think that what Carla said is really great. Um, I think what I might just add on top of that is just seeing how many products, how, so much of the work that we do, like so many products fail, right? And, and what a product manager is there to do is to help increase, increase our chances of success. And so it ends up that a good product manager can be a multiplier on the success of the team and all of the effort that every single person at a company is working so hard for. And I think that as people have seen so many of these uh, technology companies 
uh, succeeding with product managers. I think that other people have said like, hey, why don't, why don't we try that too? And they've liked it enough to stick with it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point of PMs. You know, our job is to increase the success. We hear all these statistics are like 80 plus percent or 90 plus percent, depending on the survey, you study, you read that new products fail or whatever. And uh, I like to tie it together with, you know, Mark Andreessen years ago, famously predicted software is eating the world, right? He said that. I think what's happened is software has been around long enough that people realize to your point, gosh, we're not really, it's not really successful software and people realizing why are they succeeding and why are we not? And, and product management is like, if you want to have successful software, you need product management basically, right? So cool. And I think that's a good segue to the next thing, which is if you had to summarize, like what do product managers do? If you're trying to tell someone who's thinking about getting into it. How would you summarize it? You kind of did that a little bit, I guess, but how would you, what would you tell them, Jackie? Oh boy, I think I've got something written in the book of how I define oh, okay. it and now I'm Good. like blanking on how I describe it. Um, but, but I always think of the product manager is a member of the product triad. So usually in a good, well-functioning team, an equal partner with the designer and the engineer. And the product manager is responsible for, uh, for defining the problem. So the engineer solves the problem from a technical perspective, the designer solves the problem from a user experience perspective, but the product manager is the one who says, what problem should we be solving? Is that an important enough problem? Is it, is it a real customer pain point? And what would success look like if we did solve that? Awesome, I think that's a great definition. I love that, Jackie. I think the, the focus on owning the problem is, uh, is huge. And, you know, if I had to define this in a tweet, uh, what, I, what I said the other day, for me, what PMs do is, is building the, the right thing for the right people at the right time. And I put at the right time in, in uppercase. Cool. Yeah, that's a nice, good description. And um, yeah, I think the uh, when I first got my PM job, I thought a lot about what my job was. And I would summarize it as my job is to maximize the ROI on our dev resources. Because we've got these like 20 developers, they're going to code however many hours a week. We can ask them to do this, or we can ask them to do this, right? So that's kind of a very narrow, simplistic view. Um, and these days, like the, my one word answer kind of goes off the trio, the triad you were saying, Jack, which is, okay, if developers develop, pretty straightforward, designers design, what do PMs do? And I think define is the single word I would use, like who are our customers and what are the problems? So I think that's awesome. So cool. All right, cool. Well, let's jump in. I guess one of your things as it's grown is, are all PM jobs similar? What differences are you seeing? I've seen recently some posts where people are like, there's like majors now. It's like a PM major. Are you this kind of a PM? Are you this kind of a PM? Are you getting the kind of clickbait articles? I'm curious, uh, how, how do you think about the different types of PM jobs available that are out there? Oh my God, it, it's happening now, the PM in or of everything, right? And it, again, there are so many options right now. And I think a huge misconception is that the product management team is made up of product managers. So a lot of people in the product team who might not have the product manager title, but they're still part of the product team. And thinking about project managers, technical program managers, product analysts, and, and many others, engineers, designers, uh, data. So I like to think about product you know, as, a, as a team sport where there are many people involved. So with that in mind, we see that when, when people come to us and hey, I want to be a product manager at Google. And like, well, <laughs> that sounds great as a headline, but it's really dig a little bit deeper to know what that really means because product manager is very different. And also within Google, there's so many different products, right? So part of the exercise sometimes is, is really discovering what you don't know and realizing that while the headline sounds great, well, once you understand really what's going on in a product team, a well-functioning product team of a, of a decent size, then you will have more options to decide what direction you want to go. And, and with that, obviously, there's so many different variables, right? Are we talking about a B2C consumer-facing product? Are we talking about more of an enterprise product? Are we talking about a technical product that requires maybe more of an engineering background? Are we talking about a mobile app, website, marketplace, SaaS? You know, like the ways we can categorize products are almost infinite at this point. And, and I think that is the biggest breakthrough for a lot of people who are considering to break into product. They, they think that, oh, this is a high paying job that doesn't require coding, sign me up. <laughs> well, it's, it's hard. And at the same time, it, you know, there's much more to it. Cool. 
Nice. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that point of view. And so much of what being a product manager is, is filling in the white space of what the other people on your team aren't doing. So if you are on a team with really strong designers, you'll do less design. If you're on a team with really strong researchers, you'll do less research. Um, one of the, the, uh, the models I like for thinking about PMs is uh, Sachin Reki has the, the builder, tuner, innovator um, uh, definitions for types of PMs. And the, the two that I'm sort of, I think innovator would be like you're starting a brand new product. There aren't that many of those PM jobs out there. Um, but for the other two types that I find that PMs that work on a team, like a growth team or a monetization team, a lot of, a lot of what you might be doing um, is, is quick iterations, lots of experiments, lots of quick feedback. And um, it's not throwing spaghetti at the wall. You still have to deeply understand your customers, deeply understand your hypothesis of what you think is going to, um, going to help you succeed. But it's, um, but it's got a lot more focus on measurement and um, success can easily be like, we've moved this number from here to here. Uh, whereas a different type of work is the work that ends up being more like launching a new feature to satisfy a new use case that, uh, mm -hmm. that, a, that you've discovered from a customer. And a lot of that work is, um, is running early beta programs and talking about feedback with specific people, a lot more of the, uh, the qualitative feedback than the quantitative feedback. Um, a lot more emphasis in these kinds of roles with like working with marketing and having a big marketing launch. And should you launch it with an event or at, you know, should you be sending stickers out to everybody? Um, so I do think that those two types of jobs end up uh, in your day-to-day -day work do feel somewhat, do feel fairly different. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, the, but the other thing that I would say that surprises me is that, you know, I've talked to PMs from all sorts of different companies, different industries, at tech companies and non-tech companies. And there are differences. Each of these will have, you know, uh, their own their own peculiarities. Like if you work at a non-tech company, you spend most of your time explaining what product management is and like how it can help the other stakeholders at the company. Um, but in general, the skills of product management are so generally applicable. Um, that's why we don't end up seeing quite as much specialization. I think we see a lot of generalists in the role because uh, because the core PM skills are so similar from job to job. Yeah, I think I, a lot of great advice from both you think. Like, I do think good PMs fill the gaps in their team. As you said, like if there's no designer around, who's going to do the wireframes, the PM? Um, you know, it's not sexy to have QA these days as it used to be. No QA, who's going to do the UAT, the PM, right? So that's how it goes down. And as you were telling your story, I agree. They're very different. The experimentation analytics mindset versus the, the new product, new feature mindset. It, it reminds me of the qual versus quant. And as I like to call it, the Oprah versus Spock. And some companies are much more Oprah and some companies are much more Spock. So kind of knowing who you are, or do you gravitate more towards this way or this way um, so that you match yourself with a company that's got a, con a consistent culture. So that's awesome. So, Okay. Well, what advice, I guess I'll open it pretty broadly. Like if someone's like, I, this sounds amazing. I want to get in the PM. I'm not a PM. We all know there's this catch 22. It, it, even though what you said, Carlos, is amazing. There's more open recs for PMs than actual PMs out there. People still can't get an interview. They're applying. And part of it is the catch 22 of, well, we're only going to interview a PM who has PM experience already. So how does anybody ever break the chicken and egg? So I'm just curious, what advice do you have for people on how to get that, you know, get their foot in the door to get that first interview, would you say? And Jackie just wrote an, she wrote an entire book on how to crack the PM interview. So I think he should go first. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so there's basically, oops, okay. There's about seven different ways you can break into product management. Awesome. Oh, that's um, great. But I'll, I'll focus on the, 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 some of the top ways. So, okay. um, so if you are, uh, in school, undergraduate, go for an APM program or an internship. These are just like, they're funnels. They have got like recruiters. It's like a really uh, clear path to get in. Um, okay, but the, the next two most popular ways are, one of them is gonna be internal transfer. So this is go to a company, go to a company that takes internal transfers. So like uh, Google is notoriously tough for internal transfers. Whereas like Twitter, many more people are able to make the move into product manager there. Um, and there you basically want to um, work with your current, do a good job at your current job, work with your current manager, work with hiring managers on the, on the uh, product team if they have them. And uh, a lot of this is you just start doing the job. 
So you fill in for a PM who's like out uh, out on leave, or you ask if there's like anything you could help with, or if there's like you could if you could take the lead on one of these uh, projects that's going on, and you just start doing the job, and then you you start to build up your credibility, and then you can make the transfer. Uh, so that internal transfer is uh, by far the top way that I hear of people be breaking into product management. Uh, the second uh, another top way is if you are lucky enough to get to work at a big company. So if you do work at Google, um, if you can work at a company that has a good product management culture and you're able to um, get a job that's as close to product as you can. So if you work with product in any way as possible. And, and the trick here is to just absorb the best practices. So if you can sit in on product review meetings, read the spec templates, uh, have lunch, you know, after the pandemic, uh, but like have, have coffee chats with the, have Zoom chats with, um, with product managers. And basically as much as you can absorb the best practices from this company, and then you can often go to a smaller company um, and they, they will sometimes give you the chance to be a product manager, uh, even though you've never done it before, because you know so much about what good product management looks like. So you're able to, to take that, those best practices and bring them to another company. So those are, those are the top ways that I see people breaking into product management. Uh, some people also go back to get an MBA um, and, uh, and, it, and it, it can work. It's just a very, very expensive way to break into product management. Yeah, no, that's so awesome. A great overview. And yeah, I think the thing I see the most is the internal transfer. If you're an engineer at a company or a designer at a company, just, you know, just hang around with the park team. The PMs always have way more on their plate. Just, hey, can I help you with that? Oh, do you need some QA? Do you need me to do some user reports? Or, you know, it reminds me of the Seinfeld, the Seidler. Just kind of sidle your way in. Just hang out. Like, oh, yeah. It's like, like Kramer was like at the one company you didn't even have a job at, right? Just hanging out. Oh, yeah, I'm kind of on the park team. I think that I think that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Carlos, you have anything to add on kind of breaking in? And I have a lot of empathy for people who are trying to break into product because it's hard. And even though it's true that there are a lot of companies hiring, that doesn't mean that it's easy. And since we, we interact with, with a lot of people and in a way, what we created with Product School was a much, a much more effective solution than a traditional MBA. Because when I, at least when I did my MBA, it was a two year full-time program with zero classes in product. Maybe that has changed in some cases, but at least you know, a few years ago, there was nothing like that. We decided to you know, compress this into literally two months part-time. So people don't have to take a loan and they don't have to stop their job. And at the same time, some of these credentials help these days because it's less about what you studied 10, 15 years ago and more about what you've built and who you are and how much, you know, what, what the things, some of the things that Jackie was, was mentioning. So by really putting yourself out there, showcasing not just a credential, but maybe eventually a portfolio, a, a website, or like just that sense of curiosity that you don't need a title in order to, to build, I think that that can go a long way. Yeah, that's awesome. I think you touched on something I was hoping to bring up, which is, you know, the main way someone checks you out is LinkedIn. You mentioned a portfolio or a website. You know, I remember when I was helping one, one of my clients, Medallia, we were going like crazy and we had interview like PMs or APMs actually. And like one person had like this portfolio where they posted their stuff. And I'm like, and I just kind of laughed. I'm like, okay, everybody here is saying they want to be a web PM, but only one of them actually has a website. Like you, if you, you know, so I'm just curious what, what kind of, as far as like signaling or messaging when you're trying to break in on your LinkedIn profile or on the web, what are some advice and tips for people to, to optimize their chances of getting noticed, would you say? Um, so I, I have some, um, some advice. It's not exactly related to websites, mm -hmm. um, but I've actually been mentoring some people and this one comes up again and again, which is, um, is the idea of coffee chats. So the idea of reach out, get a connection, use, work your network, do whatever you can, stalk somebody on Twitter um, and basically get, get a talk with somebody at the company you're interested in. You know, if you can talk to a hiring manager, that's like great. If you can only talk to um, someone who's a PM at the company, that's also good. And sometimes they'll pass you along. And when um, the thing that, I, that I've been really coaching people on is that it is the hiring manager's job to talk to you. Like their job, more than half of their job is recruiting people to their team. So you don't have to feel guilty if you're trying to get a coffee chat with a hiring manager. You don't have to feel shy or embarrassed that you're going to like want to want to get on the phone with them or get on a Zoom call with them. 
and, and talk to them because it's, it's their literal job to talk to you. Um, and I see people being so shy about this, but it's their literal job to try to recruit you. And it's a numbers game. So they expect to talk to 20 people for every one person they hire um, or more, maybe 50 people, you know, for every person they hire. So um, you don't have to feel bad about it. And these coffee chats are so helpful for, uh, for improving your chances of getting hired. Because on these talks, on these initial calls, they're trying to, um, they're trying to attract you. So they're going to tell you about the company. They're not trying to judge you. They'll, I mean, good hiring managers will try to do both. They'll try to evaluate you and pitch you. Um, but when they're pitching you, you can say like, you can ask all these questions. You can say, so what's your, what's your strategy for the next year? What are you most worried about? How are you addressing that? What does success for a PM look like on your team? You can, uh, what are your company values? You know, what have you seen of PMs that work out at your on your team and don't work out on your team? You can, you can get all of this information that directly translates into your answers for the interview that you're going to have later on. Um, so it's just, it's just an incredibly useful way to, uh, to get into a company and to get, to get a leg up on those interviews. And I think people uh, often shy away from them when they, when they can do better to kind of reach out to people. I think that's a great suggestion because it just feels like it's like this resume black hole. And if that's the only process or path, your odds are going to be low. So what I really hear you saying is, hey, create your own path with these coffee chats. Don't be bashful about reaching out to people on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I think there is a little technique to how you do it. You know, you can just be like, hey, I, you know, like some posts they have or something, they blog post, they write or something. You can kind of build some affinity and do that. So I think that's awesome advice. And I know for some people it's easier to reach out to strangers than other people. So, um, but I think building the network is, is important. I, I agree. And, and I, I think the point of like, to not self reject is critical. Like you don't know if you don't try. And these days there is no excuse not to actually find who the hiring manager is and find a way to message them. Because even if you don't have the email, you can guess it. And there are a lot of free tools that can show you exactly how. They've, people probably have LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram or Medium or TikTok, whatever that might be. I still use the, private, the direct messages as a, as a tool to connect with, with people. And it's a way of showing authenticity and being different. Because if you think about it, if you are applying for a competitive job and the hiring manager is inundated with resumes, like how is your resume going to stand out? I don't know, but I think that's a really good question. And one way is to make sure that you cut the line, at least give your shot. And, and then there's a lot of ways you can optimize that to Dan's point about like, okay, what should I say to make sure that this actually gets attention, but not trying uh, is you know, not going to help. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think there's one other point, Jackie, about this working around the, the main process. A lot of times they're the HR gatekeepers. And I think that these days it used to be more personalized, but now like they literally have algorithms that do the keyword analysis. And if your resume doesn't pass it, it no, no human ever sees your resume. So the other cool thing about doing what you're advising, both you're advising of like in mail or chatting is you just make sure they actually see your resume. Right. Which is cool. And, and the, the one thing I would say, I do a lot of recruiting too, is this is less for new PMs, but like people that are applying for PM jobs, I'll go to LinkedIn and they won't have product manager as their title. I'm like, what? Like, what? Like, I'm a UX designer or I'm a sales. I'm like, what? 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 Like, I know. Like, no, like, no, just like, so it's kind of like, and some people are very literal. Like, like we were talking, Microsoft calls them program managers. You know, my job before business school was technically engineer, but in hindsight, it was product manager. So is it okay if I call it a product manager, you know, kind of thing, you know? So I think you got to like, you want to smell it's like if it looks like a duck and smells like a duck you just want to make sure you look like a product manager out there you know um, i think so anyway okay let's say we get lucky and we get our interview i know there's tons of stuff we don't have to go deep on this but what are your top interview tips for maximizing your chances of like making it to the next round and hopefully eventually getting the job um i, I, I can go first on this <laughs> so uh, my top there, my top interview tip would be to prepare your key stories. So this is, you, there's, a, there's a grid in the interview book, but basically there is a handful of behavioral questions you're likely to get asked. Like, tell me about a great success. Tell me about a failure. Tell me about a conflict. Um, and just ahead of time, prepare what stories you want to tell that make you look really good. And that way you're not floundering in the moment when they ask you the question, you're just going to say like, I've got nine stories prepared. I'm going to pick the best one that matches this. 
And then for each of those, um, I've been playing around with an, you know, everyone knows the star framework, but I've been playing around with a new framework, which is the Pearl framework. <laughs> Cause I always like to invent my own frameworks. Um, it's like star, but it's problem epiphany, um, action result in learning. Um, and the idea here is that as PMs, we really wanna, we own the problem. So framing your situation as a problem really can help make sure that you're making this a juicy story, a good story. Like here's the problem, you know, here's what, here's the bad thing that happened or here's what we noticed. Um, and then epiphany is really important. This is your insight, right? It's a really, really boring story. If it's like my boss asked me to do this, so I did it, right? <laughs> it needs to be like, here's the thing I noticed that no one else did. And like, it's because I was sitting there talking to the truck drivers and I realized that our scheduling algorithm wasn't working for them in this way. So it's that you really focus on that, that epiphany or that insight. And then you can get into like, okay, so here's what I, the action I did, here's the result. And then also that learning is a really important, like put a happy ending on your story. So especially for these bad ones where like, I got into a big fight with someone and we disagreed and we had a bug that lost the company a lot of money, but here's the result, but here's what I learned from it. And here's how I did better next time. So that's a way to make sure that like, because all those like trick questions of like, tell me something bad you did, just add the learning on the end and how you did better next time. And that kind of packages it up into to a good story. Right. My weakness is sometimes I just try too hard, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> they always have, like, so it's like, it's a great point is like the questions are anticipated. And it's funny thing is back now that all the questions are online, right? A lot of them are online. There are question banks online. And so there's no real excuse for being surprised. So I think that's great to have your stories together and then like curate the story to highlight the skill that you want, I guess, right? If you want to convey this or that. Yeah. How about you, Carlos? What interview tips you have? Actually, I was just thinking, Jackie, as you were giving this answer, you actually apply that framework when you introduce yourself. You started with how you got rejected uh, from Google, and that was actually one of the best things that happened and how it took you back to your path. So I think that's right there and and i think it's important to recognize that this is a, a numbers game and, and a marathon that getting rejected is just part of the process and not being too hard on ourselves is important and also try to learn something from it as well so practicing obviously makes perfect then i remember when you told me the story about how you first got invited to give a, a, a presentation and how you practice and practice and now you're an, an incredible speaker so that is one thing. And I think the, the other part in general, I think is try to fill in the gaps because there's always a reason why someone will decline you, right? It's true that not all the companies will always tell you the truth. And they might say, well, we decided to move in a different direction. So <laughs> I, I get that part, <laughs> but you can also recognize certain patterns, right? And if you, I, I, or, or you can have a mentor or a coach that can, kind of show you some of those blind spots. And if you know that you might need more of maybe quant background or design background or a portfolio or adjusting certain things on your LinkedIn, whatever that might be, I think treating yourself as a product and make progress consistently is eventually going to lead to a greater result. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that's great. Yeah, the, um, yeah. Uh, and I would also argue, I would uh, advocate, build on what you said, Carlos, if you do get rejected, ask for feedback. Like when I was at Medallia helping them grow their product team, if somebody asked for feedback, we would give Frank feedback. But if you didn't ask, we're not going to be like, here's why you didn't get it. But if you would ask, I would actually, I would have a post. If someone was like pretty promising, but just didn't quite make it, I'd be happy to have a 30 minute debrief with them and say, look, you have a lot of potential. Here's what you did well. Here are a couple areas to work on. And so every once in a while, some hiring manager is too busy to make the time. But every once in a while, you'll find a product man a hiring manager that's willing to take the time to give you that, that frank feedback. So awesome. Okay. So let's say we get lucky, we get the offer, and we're a brand new PM for the first time. We got the job. So what advice do we have for the brand new PMs, you know, when they first get their job to be successful? What, what's the advice? Oh my God, you are in. Now, how do I show up and dominate? Well, <laughs> it's actually the opposite, right? It's like, how can I listen? compulsively and, and try not to apply my new newly uh, learned framework or tool to the entire system and show that I'm here. Uh, I, I think that also applies throughout the entire career, but specifically in the first 30 to 60 days, my advice, what I've seen in, in some PMs that were able to actually grow their career is that they were here to help first and foremost. They are not here to get credit. 
and say, mm-hmm. I did it. In a, in a way, it's probably the opposite. It's take responsibility when things don't go so well and, and give credit to the team when things go well. And, and earning that respect, I think in a way, authority is, is something that your boss will give you, your title will give you. But the respect is something that you can only earn from your interactions with your peers. And that is, that is absolutely critical if you want to be here for the long term. Yeah, that's great. I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, and you mentioned this, but um, you want your team, you know, you want to be there for your team. So I, uh, in addition to what you say, um, I, I always like to go in and just do something that makes each person on your team happy. And usually this is like in your first month, this is not your core job. This is like the engineer has been annoyed by one thing that's been stuck that like hasn't gotten approval from legal. And so you're going to go and just undo that. And the data scientist just like wants somebody to read through a bunch of like, you know, a hundred like pieces of customer feedback and just tag them all, you know, just finding these like grunt work, boring things that just will have each person on your team being like, oh, I'm glad you're here because um, it's very hard to start building and getting good feedback and, um, and getting off on the right foot. If, you know, like at Mike at, uh, at Asana, we would do like 90 day feedback. And the, one of the worst feedback that I would sometimes get from people is like, oh, I don't have any feedback for them because uh, they haven't really done anything yet. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> um, so just making sure that nobody's going to say that about you and then you can go in. <laughs> Um, And then beyond that, I think uh, a place where I see a lot of people kind of trip up is just uh, aligning on expectations. So the PM job is a little bit different at every single team, not even company. Every single team, even within the same company, is going to be a little bit different. Um, And even just like every time you work with another person. So early on, it's it can be uncomfortable, but like have that converse, like really upfront conversation of like, what does success look like to you? Uh, what do you like, you know, how do you like to divide work with a PM ideally? Who, uh, who do you see is, is going to be like leading the sprint kickoffs? Whose responsibility is it to triage bugs? Um, if you're working with a designer, like how do you like to get feedback? Like, do you want to meet once a week? Do you want to like show designs every day? Do you have any pet peeves I should be worried about? And with your manager, like, you know, are there any like, you know, how soon do you expect me to be launching something? Are there have any deliverables coming up? You know, if I launch this by then, would that look good? Would that be, would that be you know, meeting or exceeding expectations? Um, because so much of the time, people have one view of what they expect the PM to do based on the last PM they worked with. And your view might be entirely different. Um, and and uh, by the time you realize that you've been missing each other's expectations, now you're kind of kind of mad at each other. And that's a tough time to have that conversation. Yeah, no, I think both of you, that's great advice from both of you. I love to just listen, like be a sponge. The one mistake I see, uh, not to pick on MBAs, but it, the MBAs are older and they're farther in their career. So when they get the PM job, they sometimes they come in hot. It's like, all right, here's what we're going to do. And, they, and it's like, uh, hey, buddy, we've been doing this for years before you showed up, right? We, we know what we're doing here. So like just listening to your point, understanding the context and just listening. And it's actually a very unique time. As you know, your calendar will quickly look like Tetris. Quickly, you'll be, you'll be triple booked and you have to decide. You have to use like an ROI analysis to figure out which meeting to go to. And uh, it's a unique time to do what you said, Jackie, as well. I like the coffee chat idea. That's when I, in the first 90 days, like you don't have meetings yet. Go have a one-on-one with the marketing person. Have a one-on-one with the designer, with the engineering manager. Because once you get in your day-to-day, you're not going to have time to do that. And you have this kind of grace period where you're the new kid on the block. Oh, yeah, you can use that excuse. Hey, I'm a new PM. I just want to know how things work over here. Can you, can you meet with me and tell me about it, right? And then, you know, months down the line, when you're suddenly doing a, marketing, a project with marketing, they'll be like, oh, it's that person that I talked to instead of who's this stranger that's bugging me. So I think that, that's important. And I love the, what you were saying Jackie about just add some value, help out what you're saying, Carlos, right? It, it, I remember being surprised that part of our unofficial job was like team cheerleader. Like when stuff go, the release goes bad, who's there to pick everybody up, right? It's like the PM, Hey, come on. It's okay. You know? And, um, and I love your idea of fixing the, uh, fix a little dissatisfied perfect. It reminds me of Ted Lasso when he first came in in the bad showers and he fixed the showers and they noticed, Hey, he actually fixed the showers. Right. So, and of course, Ken Norton, he's also been on here. His tagline is bring the donuts, right? In the old days, you just bring the donuts for people. Anyway, so yeah, I think that's all, that's all great stuff. So 
Cool. So let's say we survive, you know, our first year as a PM and, and we're, you're doing okay. How should we be thinking about, you know, growing our career? And maybe we can start out. I know I like to always think about skills and I know Jackie, your book, your new book is all about skills. So how as a new PM should I be thinking about my PM skills and how I should be building them over time? Maybe yeah. we start with Jackie. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so in the, in the cracking the PM career book, I organized the skills into product execution, strategy, and leadership. Um, but before I did this, I went out and I looked at like career ladders from every company I could get my hands on. Um, and I was looking at, you know, dozens and dozens of these. And what really surprised me was that there was no consistency zero consistency and like really, really wildly different slices. Like one of them grouped it into like things you do for your team, things you do for your division and things you do for the company or something. Right. Um, and, um, and then the other thing that I realized is that a lot of these career ladders and the way they describe these skills is, is unhelpful at best and misleading at worst. So they would be like, you know, like write specs, writes good specs, writes really good specs. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, or they'd be like, owns a feature, owns a feature area, owns a product, owns a product line. And, yeah. um, and these things, they, they wouldn't, or they'd have like a million bullet points. And I'd be like, I know people aren't hitting all those bullet points before they get promoted to the next level. Right, right. Um, so, so as I dug into this, uh, what I realized is that, the uh, those career ladders that break down in terms of getting promotions, in terms of advancing your career, uh, those career ladders are are not going to be the uh, the, the guidebook that you need to advance, um, and because uh, there's they're, they're misleading. So there's this other thing which is like how you advance, and basically what this is is that there are three stages to a PM's career, and the first stage is um, is shipping product. So in the first stage of your career, and you get better and better and better at this, is when your job is to ship products that delight customers and hit the goals. So in these stages, you're doing a lot of product design work and a lot of execution work. And your leadership skills need to be good enough that you can, you know, communicate what you're doing to the rest of the team, keep people like organized, you know, resolve conflicts. Um, but your job is, is to ship these products that are going to delight customers and hit the goals. And as you get better and better and better at this, so you're shipping bigger products with more ambitious goals and fancier launches and more complex execution skills. Um, at some point, people start to plateau and they wonder why they're not getting promoted anymore and why like just getting better at shipping product isn't, isn't what gets them to advance. And the reason is because to break into senior PM, it's actually a new job. It's not the same job as as uh, as like APM and PM1, PM2. Uh, here, your job is really to create winning strategies. So it's a, it's a new type of work. Your work is really not just about shipping products that hit the goals and delight customers, but about saying, what goals should we be going after? What are the new opportunities that nobody else around me identified that I think are important that we should go after? So it's really about identifying these new opportunities and creating strategies to explain, this is how our product is gonna win in the marketplace. So all of the work you're doing in your day-to-day -day job as a like APM is you'll still keep doing that work as a senior PM, but that's not what gets you promoted. What gets you promoted is identifying those new opportunities for what your team should be doing. And then uh, there'll be another leap later on in your career, which is to get to like senior director, which is when your job shifts again. And now it's about organizational excellence. So it's about, um, it's about building a strong team. It's about being able to create a team that scales beyond what you personally could do as a great PM for building strategy, for strategy and, um, and shipping products. So, uh, so what does that mean for which skills you need to build? Um, so the first is that you need to be able to do the day-to-day -day work of a PM in about a third to a fifth of the time that it takes when you started as an APM. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you start off, like every new, like little feature you build, you're going to be writing specs for a week and it'll, you'll get your feedback and you have to go back and iterate it and you have to like go through it again. So you need to invest in these skills. You need to get really good at user research and understanding customers and identifying your hypothesis and coming up with good ways to experiment and figuring out how to stay on top of project management for your team. Um, 
but you need to be able to basically like master that time management and get good at these things so that uh, instead of like taking five iterations, it takes two iterations. <laughs> um, and that frees up the time to then really um, take all of this customer facing work you've been doing and start identifying new opportunities. So, so the way that people become strategic is not usually with like um, a strategy that has nothing to do with what their main job is. Most of the time it's, I was researching my main job and I noticed this funny thing that kept coming up in user research. And like, I think, I think there might be an unmet customer need here. I think we should really go after this type of customer. And then you put together a proposal and a vision and a strategic framework and a roadmap and are able to pitch the company on that. And that's how you make that move into strategy. That, that's awesome. I, I love that three phases of your thing. And, and then thinking back in my career, I can think about when I transitioned from one to two and how exciting that was. That's awesome. That, that, that's really great. So, and I know the thing, and I love the, the categorization of the skills that you have. Um, and that's the thing as Carlos was saying too, like, it's like, you need so many different skills. It's like a Swiss army. You need to be like a Swiss army knife, right? Kind of. It's like, you have to be good at this and that and agile and man, the prioritization. So I, what I often, I ask this a lot in interviews too, just to get us, is like, if you had to prioritize, which is one of our top skills, like what would be the top two or three? It's like, okay, if you're a new PM to really be like a 10 X PM or to really be really successful, what are the things that set, let's flip it around. What set the best, what skills set apart the best PMs from like the so-so PM? What would you say? If you had to pick like two or three, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but what, what would you say? For me? Um, sure, I both you, it, yeah. Uh, Carlos, do you have a dancer? <laughs> oh, you, you can go. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I, I really think it ends up depending on what that team needs. Okay. And, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of analytical problem solving. Mm -hmm. I will say that if I had to pick just one, I think that people that can take a large amorphous problem, you know, and I've done this in so many different ways, you know, one point we, uh, I had a PM and we were like, so top thing we get on our, on our customer feedback is that the product's too hard to use. Here you go. <laughs> Solve it. <laughs> Got it. And, and, you know, she yeah. took this and she was able to break it down. Like, okay, what does this feedback mean? What are they really saying? What would a solution look like? And, um, and really narrowed it down, focused on a specific large slice of the problem, came up with the idea of a redesign. And it was one of the most successful, you know, launches we ever had. Um, and I've also seen people who use the same analytical skill for, you know, which language should we launch first? Or what does it mean to, to go after uh, not just project managers, but uh, portfolio managers? Just taking this like two word, like here's the problem and just like being like, yeah. you figure out what to do with that. Got it. Yeah, no. So like, I would, I would, I think that's great. And I can resonate with what you're saying. Like, I would say like being able to handle complexity and being able to simplify complexity, like apply your analytical skills to make sense out of it. And, and a certain amount of like self-sufficiency, like you don't need to be told what to do. That's awesome. I think that's great. How about you, Carlos? You know, in, in my experience, what I've seen is that leaders lead regardless of their title. And a lot of people, when they get a promotion, there is a reason behind that. They already earned that credibility to now have that authority. So, most of my most successful PMs actually grew from within. They are people who really build that trust foundation with others and even with myself as a product person who is now having a different title. In reality, I treat my company as a product. And I need strong product leaders who are able to push back on me and really show that they, I can trust them and that they, they got it. They will do whatever it takes to continue you know, shaping this vision together. It's, it's actually as hard for them as it is for me because, you know, as, as I redefine my own job description, I, I default, I gravitate towards product. That's what I love the most. But I need to step back if I want the company to grow. And I want those product leaders to really be able to manage up, manage down, manage on, on their sides and really be that trusting partner for others. Like reliability and knowing that when you give something to someone, they will do something good with it. And that things don't won't fall through the cracks. It's just so important in in a high stakes environment where you know things are moving fast, and that I tend to give more things to busy people because I know <laughs> they will find time for what's really important. 
That's great. Yeah, no, I think, I think problem solving is uh, really important. I think what you said, leader, informal leadership, right? Cause no one reports to you. It's like, how can you kind of rally people and explain to get them excited and why you should be doing what you're doing. That's an informal leadership, which is awesome. I would add my third one to those, which are both awesome would just be prioritization. Cause I feel like there's always so many more ideas and so many more things that we can ever do. And it's like, you know, you got to make decisions on why we should do what's the most important thing and what, which is kind of what you touched on as well, Carlos. So that's awesome. Cool. Okay, cool. And then, um, Let's see. So any, I love you already kind of talked about the three phases of your career, which is great. And I guess, um, you know, at some point you're going to become a people manager for the first time if you're lucky. And, and I know that's a, that can be a big transition for a lot of PMs. So any advice to, for PMs that are becoming a people manager for the first time? My first thing would be, do you really want to be a people manager? Because I think there's no right or wrong answer. At least when I, when I started engineering, someone told me, kid, you are going to start as a software engineer. And if you do really well, you will become a senior software engineer. And if you crush it, you will become a principal software engineer. I'm like, oh my God. Like, are you saying that the more, the better I code, the more, you know, coding responsibilities you are going to give me. And then maybe if I absolutely crush it as a principal engineer, you will make me a manager. Like similar to what Jackie was saying, like what is the correlation between being very good at one thing and take as an individual contributor and now having to be excellent as a manager? I think the beautiful thing in product or in general in other careers is that you have options. And, and I know there are career paths for PMs that really enjoy being on the front lines, building, shipping, working directly with engineers, designers. And I think these people should really be rewarded for that and not have to worry about managing others if that's not what they like. Now, however, there are others that actually enjoy that part. So I think having that awareness about yourself is a really good first step. Yeah, I, I love that. I um, I very much try to kind of talk people out of people management sometimes because it is it's it's not as much fun as you think it is. It's not as not as much control as you think it is. Um, uh, at the same time, I also don't think it's very easy to talk people out of it because I think a lot of PMs are the kind of people who who kind of need to experience it for themselves. So maybe what I'd say the most is if you tried and you don't like it, um, consider you can always go back. Um, and also that a lot of uh, a, a, a trend I see is people leaving a company that they like for a company that will make them a people manager. And I generally see that going badly. Um, I think that um, that I've seen a lot of people switch companies for the promise of being a people manager. And then when they get there, it's taken away and they actually don't even become a people manager. Right. So, um, so I'd say that the company you're at, I think, matters more than, than your title or your role. Um, but that said, let's say you do want to be a people manager, you became a people manager, um, really understanding how your job has shifted and what success looks like at this level, I think is really important. And the metaphor that really works for me that kind of unlocks it in my mind is that um, a good PM, imagine you're a good PM working with your designer. Do you go to your designer and say, like, make that bold and change that red to blue and like, you know, you know, move this over here? Like, no, you're you don't get yourself into the solutions. Instead, you say, like, hey, here's what our goals are. Here's what success looks like. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. You know, I'd love to see like, you know, what your solution looks like. And then I can give you feedback, be like, oh, you know, we really wanted the primary action to be visible. You know, do you think we're succeeding at that goal? So that same metaphor of how you work well as a PM with your designer is how you work well as a PM manager with your PMs, is you are explaining the strategy, the larger context, the goals that you have for the, for the, the broader product team and giving them feedback in terms of that, of those broader goals. Um, so if you take that metaphor and really your job is not to like show off all your smart ideas, um, but rather to frame the problems in such a way that the people on your team will be able to, uh, to come up with their best work. I think that that really can help. Um, the other really, this is super tactical, right? But um, it's always easier to start by giving people small amounts of responsibility. And like you have, you have to explain this upfront, right? But you say, I'm going to give you a little bit of responsibility because we're just starting to get to know each other. We haven't built up trust yet. And... Um, if you do well in this project, next time I'm going to let you take a larger role. And next time I'll let you take a larger role. And next time I'll let you take a larger role. And it's much, much easier to, to give people more and more responsibility as they succeed at what they're doing. 
if you ever give somebody too much responsibility and have to pull it back, um, very likely that person will quit because people do not like having responsibility taken away from them. So start small, get bigger, uh, rather than, than erring on the side of giving them too much. But you have to you have to draw it out for them so they know that they will be getting more responsibility um, eventually. I think yeah, I think that's a great tip. And and I saw what you see too. Like some people leave a company to get a bigger title, bigger job. Usually it's a big company to small company, right? It's like some I'm I'm in a senior PM or I'm a group PM here, and this startup's gonna let me be a director, and I'm gonna have a team for the first time. And I think it's just a, it's like a people manager is like that part of your job is so different. And I think a lot of PMs are very self-sufficient and they're, they're used to not being able to rely on a lot of people. So they fill the gaps. Like they're just used to being like self-sufficient and then they become a manager and they're still in that self-sufficient mode and they have a tough time, like letting go and delegating, I think. So I think that's awesome advice. So, okay, cool. Well, thanks so much for the panel discussion. Uh, we have a few questions here in the chat and what we'll do is I'll call out your name and we'll get you up here. So you can, with your video, so you can ask your question in person. Okay. So let's see, we have um, April L. You want to ask your question here? Let me, I'll ask you, oh, ask you to unmute. There we go. Let me get you in here with us one sec. All right. Welcome, April. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, Jackie, and Carlos for this informative session. I have learned a lot. Uh, myself, I'm currently a master's student studying in FinTech uh, program, and um, I want to start my future career as the first step as APM, I wonder what kind of salary range are we facing in terms of being APM and then uh, progress through into different levels and then ultimately to a people manager in the future. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, so there's, uh, there's a website called levels.fyi. This is so great. It'll show you by company what the salary ranges are and how they how the levels match up across companies. So you can then go in there, click in, see what the latest is because it's constantly changing. And I bet it's totally different than it was, you know, two years ago even. Um, but I will say that at, at a, um, the, the ranges, so the company you're at matters more than your level, right? If you are Google and you're hired in as, you know, an APM, as an APM or you get to like PM1, you'll be making possibly more money than like senior directors or VPs at, at much smaller companies. Um, and if you are at one of the, the big companies, the, the salary ranges are really good. Like I was comparing them, like when I was looking at the book, I was like, you know, you've been a PM for seven years, you get to like senior PM, you're probably making as much as doctors are making. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's a great, it's a great, and you didn't have to go to med school. So yeah, it's a great career path. Uh, you cannot kill anyone either. <laughs> <laughs> also, April, I would share a link here. It's a PM salary calculator created by Amplitude. They did a really good research where they ask you a few questions about your location and other skills, and then they give you a, a range. But I would kind of encourage you to think about this uh, in a complementary way, because I know salary is important. Obviously, each person has their own situation. You said you are a student and you are thinking about getting your first job, right? So that means hopefully you have a really long and successful career. And probably your first salary is not going to be that much of a difference compared when you look at this 20 years from now. So if, if you, I would encourage you to think about other variables that make you happy. So, you know, to see if there is something there. I think that's great advice, Carlos. I would just say like, yeah, what are the variables? There's like salary, there's kind of like kind of your happiness fit with the culture and the product and what you're working on the team. And I would say there's a third one. What I optimized for personally was learning. You know, I, I wanted to make sure I was in a good environment and culture, but I mainly went into it because everybody said it was the best place to learn. Or Microsoft was also a great place to learn these companies. So early in your career, you might want to decide what, what do you most focus on? Yeah, I might just add on to that, that um, in terms of great places to learn, I often recommend to people, if you have a choice to go to a large tech company that does product management well as your first role um, for a lot of reasons. One is that you'll absorb best practices, right? You'll get to see how the good companies do it and you won't spend you know, five years of your career wondering if you're doing it right. Um, another is you start to build up a really good network. The people that you know are gonna go start their own companies and they'll like hire into their company in a few years. Um, also it looks great on your resume, right? It's like, it starts to give you the credentials you need so that the doors are open to you in the future. 
Um, so that really helps. Um, it, they do pay more, they pay higher salaries so you can start to build up that nest egg. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of finding a really good team, that's a good match for you. Um, oh, people ask me like, how do you find a good manager? <laughs> right? How can you like find a good manager? And the, the best way I know to find a good manager it's really, really hard. Like, it's like, who's going to be like the expert interviewer who asks the right question of the manager to know that they're a good match for you or not. Um, but once you're at a big company, there's an internal grapevine. And so if you go to Google or Intuit or Microsoft or any of these companies, and let's say you hate your manager, you can ask around and be like, who are the good managers? <laughs> and someone else will be able to tell you, especially a company with an APM program, like APMs, you know, great grapevine. <laughs> And then you can try to find somebody who's a really good match for you. Um, so that can be that can be another way that you sort of reduce the risk to make sure that you would have at least one good manager early in your career. Yeah, I would echo that advice. I mean, and the, another advantage is if you like get tired of working one product area, they've got so many other products you can like just switch and not lose any title level capital, any of the relationship you build. So you can have a whole career. It gives you that option, not that you have to stay at one company for a while, but it gives you that option. So I think that's awesome advice. Cool. All right. Thanks, April. Awesome. So, uh, Phil, if you're there. All right. Let me get you in here. Thanks. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, Jackie, and Carlos for the session. Um, yeah, I think you, you've pretty much well answered this in, in the talk so far. But um, what I feel is that when, when we go as, as a product manager, we're incubating a product in the company and inevitably the company incubates you to become a certain type of, of PM. So as, as you, you're evaluating a new company, I'm currently transition, in a transition, what would your top tips be um, on how to evaluate that in, uh, environment to maximize your success? So any red flags, things like that. Nice. And are you looking at big companies or startups? I came from a startup. I am looking at big companies, but um, really trying to focus in on, on a passionate area. Um, so it kind of narrows the field a bit. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of looking at big companies, um, there's uh, the app Blind, I think, is a good place to sort of people will talk about what different companies are like. There's Glassdoor reviews. And then, of course, you know, anybody can use in your network who's been at those companies. Um, but big companies tend to be very, very different, depending on how big they are, very different cultures from part to part. So, you know, I was at Microsoft and I was on the Office team and we were so different from Microsoft's, uh, from Windows team and so, so different from the MSN team, like the, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I do think that like finding out about the people who work in the division that you're interested in can really help. Um, and if you are looking at smaller companies, I think, um, one thing that can help is looking at where the founders came from, because that, that might shape their idea of, of what the culture should be. And is, is there any, you know, things you say, ask the hiring manager to like in a live session, say in a coffee chat that you'd recommend for new PMs to kind of dig into, to understand what that culture could be? Yeah, I like, um, I think this question maybe came from Teresa Torres, but just, um, like, tell me about like some of like the, you know, last big thing you guys shipped. How did that idea come to be? You know, how did, what was the role of the PM and what was the role of the manager? What were like, were there any like really interesting decisions that ended up having to get made and how'd they get make, made? Um, so that, that can really help. Um, Cause like uh, if you're good, if I'm thinking about like a lot of it ends up being like, what's the bad thing you got burned by before? And then how do you protect against that one thing? <laughs> Um, but a lot of times, like some companies are very sales oriented or very much like the building, the thing that just one person wanted. Um, so that'll help you learn or also just like how much of a micromanager is the head of product. You know, these things can kind of come out in that question. Yeah. And Carlos, and yeah. 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 And, and even the CEO, right? Like the CEOs tend to influence the uh, roadmap way too much. So trying to learn about how product decisions being made really is important. I also... Phil, I want to invite you to, to think about this as a, as a growth opportunity because looking for a job can be seen in as a, like, oh my God, I need to find a job versus, wow, I have an opportunity now to think about my next act, right? And, and it goes both ways to Jackie's point. You have a wonderful opportunity to really be picky 
and ask curious questions, not just because there's a manual that says, this is what you have to ask the hiring manager to look smart. No, it's truly like from the bottom of your heart, what do you, do you really care about, right? And, and try to make this a, a dialogue in two ways. Obviously, when assuming that um, you have the, the, the credentials and they want you and you want them, but like, at the end of the day, it's a little bit of a numbers game. So if you have more options out there, that will give you more leverage, that will give you more confidence. If you have a little more of time, in general, those things act in your favor. When you, not just you, but like when someone is in the market and they really need to find a job just to, to survive, then I think we're having a very, well, you know, we have to have a very different conversation. So, you know, I just want to encourage you to think big because it's amazing. What if you find that, that product that you're passionate about? What if you can really shape the culture of that organization? What if you can bring in people that you know and really, you know, build something bigger together? I would add, I think Jackie brought up a very important point, which is different cultures at a high level, not to oversimplify. It's like how empowered is product there, right? Some companies are very sales driven and whatever the sales team sells, like, Hey, product team, you got to go build this. I just signed a $10 million contract, right? That's, and then there are other places that are very engineering centric, eh, you know, and it's like, you have to spend all this time trying to persuade the engineer. No, really. I talked to customers. No, really. We really should do this. It's like, eh, I don't really like doing that. So, you know, that one thing I like to ask, and, it, you know, all the things being equal, I want to go to a company where, and it has to be a balance. You can't have any one group too empowered, but it's not fun to be, it can be not fun to be a PM at a company that's super sales focused or super engineering focused. And so one thing I'll ask is try to get a sense of that. When it's my turn to ask questions, a hiring manager at the end, I'll try to ask some questions. Hey, how do you make product decisions here? Uh, what if sales and product disagree? How does that get resolved? What if product and engineering disagree? How do you resolve that, right? And that can be telling in like, you know, if it's more egalitarian or if it's like, well, we, we lose the tie. We always lose the tie. Then it's like, okay, you know. I think life is too short to work for a company that a product that you don't care about or an organization that doesn't understand why product is such an important part of the culture. I agree. Thank, thank you so much. All great advice. Great. Thanks, though, for your question. Okay, Carrie, you have a question? I'm off mute. Let's see if I can do the video thing here. So I think what you were just talking about is actually a great segue to what I was going to ask. And that is I started as an engineer. And so for me, I realized I was a product person before there was a word for it. But then I career changed. I became a domain expert, really passionate about an area and changes I wanted to see in the world. And I'm realizing in this conversation now, maybe we haven't talked about it, but it would be helpful like from an entry level perspective. How important is it, scale of zero to 10, to actually be a domain expert or aspire to be a domain expert in your industry compared to just excelling at product skills? Great question. That is a great point. I would like to, to take a step at it, Kerry, because um, we, we have a lot of people who ask the same. And I think I would break it down depending on where you are in your career. You mentioned that yeah, you know, when you are trying to break into product, the domain expertise is probably much more relevant than maybe later. Jackie mentioned before that there's a lot of transfer, transferable skills as a PM and it's easier to switch career, um, industries. But it's true that as a recruiter, if I'm wearing the hat of a recruiter right now and I'm hiring a product manager and I look at your resume or your LinkedIn profile and I don't see the word product or not often enough or like I'm having questions about your you know, total PM experience. If I see that you have a lot of experience in, in my field, in, in the type of products that we're working on. That's going to give me a hint. And I'm going to want to talk to you by default because I can see that you can add value. If I don't see PM experience and I don't see domain expertise and I have many other options, it's just going to be harder for me as a recruiter to prioritize you. you know? Now, if you are at a later, later stage in your career, when you are a PM, you have this successful track record, and maybe you want to switch industries, I'm, as a recruiter, I'm, I'm fine. Like I'm going to be much more flexible. If you happen to know both, that's great. But in reality, I think the domain expertise would be, in my opinion, a little bit less relevant a little bit later in your career. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, um, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think it, it really depends on, on what the domain expertise is and which kind of companies you're going to. So um, I've, I've met people who transitioned from being a doctor, like a medical doctor, to working at a healthcare company. 
And their domain expertise was incredibly valuable because the, the company had a bunch of people but didn't have anyone who, who knew healthcare other than them and someone who had actually been there and could know how it was working. You know, somebody who um, is a lawyer, has been a lawyer and now is trans transitioning to legal documents or someone who's been a real estate agent is now working on uh, real estate tech. I think that these can be really, really helpful if you, to the extent that the, um, the kind of product you work on is one where that domain expertise is really going to help. Um, it's crazy that you picked healthcare because that's actually for me. I was a techie who went into healthcare yeah. to help save lives, loved ones, became a clinician. And now the reason I'm in tech is to deliver good health tech. Yeah. Um, and for me, and maybe I don't know, hopefully this is relevant for other people. For me, I found my way back in was to do strategy more so than kind of hands on sure. product because it's seeing opportunities. It's the stuff that you said is usually later in a product career, but I feel like I already went through some of the other product when I was engineering. Mm -hmm. So how often do you see people who come in doing domain strategy and then going to product or do, do people tend to not go that direction? Uh, that, that's the way that people come. Yeah, that's a, that's a good direction. And yeah, that sounds like your background, you, you know the space. And so you notice things that other people don't. And that's, that's always what I recommend to people with domain expertise is that, especially when you're making that transition, to find some place where they value your domain expertise, because that way, those years of experience, you get credit for them, right? Yeah. You, want, you want them to see how senior you are, and they, you want them to value all of those years you had as a clinician. So, um, so I think, yeah, that, um, that if you're already spotting opportunities, strategy is a great way to get in. And that means that you'll also have this leg up on that transition to senior PM, which um, most PMs find really, really tough. But if you've already got strategy down, that promotion will, uh, will be much easier for you. So you're, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, Thanks, I think, yeah. And I would say, I think one other thing is, you know, a lot of times to Jackie's point, you have a bunch of just kind of, for lack of a better term, plain vanilla PMs who don't have domain expertise. So one thing a lot of times a director of people do is say, I'm going to take a portfolio approach. Instead of hiring one more rock star vanilla MPM, let me hire someone who maybe doesn't have as much PM, but has the domain expertise to complement my team and be a resource. So I see that happen a lot. And then you, you don't see it as much, but you do see that strategy path that you mentioned. So I'm really happy that you found that path. That's awesome. Yeah. But exactly. I will say also, a lot of times my hiring managers are always like, I want both. I want a strong PM and I want them to be an expert in, you know, thermonuclear devices. Like, what, what, do what? Like, what are you doing? And they'll like, and I'll be like, okay, let's do the Venn diagram. And I'm like, how long do you have to hire this person? Oh, we need him like today. I'm like, okay, well, which one would you pick? Right. So I almost always advise, and most of the, a lot of times the hiring manager, they're not as strong in product because product people be like, Hey, look, it's transferable skills. Good PMs always have to ramp up quickly in whatever space they're in. That's just what you use part of the course. Right. And so if I had to pick one, I would pick strong PM skills, but you know, if you can get both, it's awesome. So those are some of the ways to break in. I see. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Good luck. All right. Next question is Ikram. There he is. All right. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right, Jackie, Carlos, thank you so much uh, for, for the session. Uh, and uh, it's been a great uh, insightful information that you guys uh, have provided. So, so I appreciate that. Uh, my question is around uh, setting up uh, team topology. And uh, uh, I, I recently, you know, kind of uh, piggybacking on what, what Carrie had said, I actually used to be in the healthcare space and I launched multiple products, uh, you know, in healthcare supply chain and, and uh, electronic medical records. Uh, gained a lot of PM skills, but then I got an opportunity to lead a product team, you know, but it was a completely different uh, space, right? It's a, it's a now more electrical contractor and we're launching products for procurement uh, uh, enablement. Uh, and it's uh, the, the key skill set, you know, they, that they looked uh, for was the product skills that, that Dan was trying to mention, right? And launching the product. So, so now I'm in a position where um you know, setting up the team topology by the end of uh, this year, uh, you know, we kind of uh, want to have that right setting. Uh, you know, we are a B2B. And, uh, you know, uh, in my understanding, there's like customer, uh, uh, customer experience product managers versus, you know, uh, uh, platform product managers. Um, and now we were trying to now set it up uh, in the most effective way that we can empower the teams and then create products, uh, you know, that, that our customers will enjoy, have be successful in, in using them. So I'm kind of uh, in a in a situation where it's, you know, I'm not able to like 
find the best way to align uh, the product engineering, the, the product trio with the right topology. Uh, the current startup, they don't have much experience from the product side. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research. I do have a proposal uh, for them, but I'm just not fairly confident that uh, working through uh, platform teams and customer experience team and kind of helping the team actually understand that this is where we're going to be heading to. And a lot of next year's strategy and, and uh, you know, releases will be dependent on this setting up this topology and like how the teams will gel together, the product trio specifically, right? So any advice on uh, kind of uh, 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 the, the best way and the guidelines to, to set this up? I can I can kind of start. I <laughs> I saw Dan. I saw you nodding a lot too. So I bet you have ideas. Yeah. yeah sure. Um. Okay. So this thing I've definitely gone through and and done these uh, trying to reorganize teams and and set up topologies. So, um. So first thing I would do is focus in on your your product strategy and your company strategy. Um. So if you have a strategy, I love strategies that have like pillars, like three pillars and you're like, okay, this is what success is going to be. We're going to need to like do the, you know, early days of Asana where like, you know, we have to understand all the information about work. And then that was one pillar. And then we have to draw insightful connections with the information we understand. So like analysis, that was another, and we have to be always available. So mobile and security and stability kind of stuff. And so once you have your strategy, right, your strategy should come first and then you can figure out the topology. Um, if you can give, uh, if you can set up your topology to match your strategy, that's great. Doesn't always work, but that would like be my first choice. If I'm like, okay, one of our goals is to, um, like another part way that we had broken down our strategy was like, uh, land and expand. <laughs> so like, you know, win new customers and then grow within it. And so you could have one set of people owning land and another set owning expand. So owning parts of the strategy can be really great. Um, so so Jackie, that, sorry to interrupt, just one yeah. clarification. So when you said win new customers and then own them, so win new customers was like uh, that acquisition product managers that you had, is that what you did? This is actually how we ended up splitting up our sales team. We had the mm -hmm. land sales team and the expand sales team, um, but we did have people who were work for working on understanding new types of information. So Asana started with tasks and we figured out, can we understand, you know, time and, you know, no. calendars or portfolios. Uh, and then the other part was like drawing insights, like can we do reporting and these kinds of things. Um, but beyond that, I really like teams that are organized around goals or problems or user types. So like one team owns admins and like what's the most important thing for admins and how are we going to get more admins to not block purchases or encourage the purchase or expand the purchase. And so um, giving giving teams like, as specific or broad goals as you, as you sort of can, as they can be trusted with. And as the leadership team is willing to hand over trust, um, depend, like at small companies, a lot of times the CEO doesn't want to hand over that much trust. So finding a way where, where you can define the scope so they can own that can be really good. Um, and then the other thing to consider is dependencies. Um, the more that you can organize things to reduce dependencies, uh, the better. Every time somebody's got to work across teams, that is going to slow things down and cause problems and like risk that every you know the whole project falls apart. So if you think about which teams often need to work together, um, the more that you can organize the topology so people are usually working within their own team. And as you add structure, you basically want people to not have to go all the way up to the top of the. They don't. You don't want the CEO to have to resolve disputes. You want you want you know as much as possible teams that are are going to have conflict are very close together. Got it. Okay. That helps a lot. Thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah. I think Jackie's advice is pure gold. I love that. Yeah. Organizing team by goals, user types, and problems. What you don't want to do is organize by part of the code base. That's how most people, the engineering sets the tone usually by code base and then PMs follow. And then it's like, we got to build this feature. Okay. We need the front end team and the back end team. And you end up like, what? Why isn't it not one team? Right. Yeah. But I think that's great. And the reduced dependency thing is huge because yeah. when you, but that might be a simplifying factor is try different topology designs on paper and then figure out how many dependencies are there. I think that's a great, great concept because again, when people aren't deliberate about the topology, they end up with all these dependencies. You end up with scrum of scrums and like this crazy thing and nobody can do anything on their own. So I think that's, no, I think that's, that's great advice. Point. So uh, kind of like uh, engineering driven at this point, Dan, like, and it's more on modules than like uh, user types or problems, uh, Dan, at this yeah, point. That's why they do it. Yeah. And now like, 
when we are trying to kind of uh, uh, organize the, the team by uh, the customers or segments, right? Uh, so the kind of uh, like the, the point overlay. that Jackie had made, yeah. yeah, there's a- You get this engineering structure and this PM and this overlay and it just, it's, now there's more dependencies. It's horrible. Everyone's going to double meetings, you know, like. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, you know, but I think uh, uh, what I like, Jackie, is like kind of going through by the strategy and like that, that's when you get the leadership buy-in as well. And like, then it becomes a little easier to, you know, divided by the right- um, um, you know, even like the buy-in from the engineering will be become easier as uh, as, as, that, as we try to align that with the the goals and the uh, and divide them into pillars. So I think that that's good. Cool, awesome, Ekram. Good luck. Thanks for your question. Thank you. All right, last question of the night, Adarsh. If you want to hop in, well, there we go. Hi there. All right. Uh, thanks, Jackie, uh, Carlos, and Dan uh, for spending your time. I have. This with me on my table. So, yeah, awesome. That's fun. Um, so, I just recently transitioned from uh, a product analyst uh, to senior product manager um, at, an, at an e commerce firm. Uh, so, it's been, thank you. So, it's been uh, four, four, four to five months uh, already. So, I just launched the product. It has been stressful, to be honest. Uh, uh, so I'd like to know like what what a new PM can do to increase uh, the execution part, like to improve the execution part, uh, because that is where something uh, that I've identified that uh, I can improve upon uh, moving forward. So yeah, have you got any suggestions? Do you have any, uh, you can feel free to anonymize it, but do you have any more uh, sort of like details on where, where in the execution, what went wrong? So uh, it, it did not go wrong. Uh, so uh, yeah, so let me summarize it for you. So there was a component of go-to-market, uh, which I did not foresee um, in, in my entire project plan. And uh, uh, so that was something which, I had to like work upon and like gather to gather through all the teams uh, during the week of the launch, and that was very stressful. So I would want to avoid that uh, in the upcoming launches. So this is just an example. Yeah. Sure. Um, so so for that, uh, my my one of my favorite tools for execution and for almost everything is templates. <laughs> so um, so you can do templates and checklists. So basically. Um, and if you work at a company with other PMs, you can all work together to create these, but say that like, look, here's what our launch template looks like. Here are the different things that um, are all the different steps that might make up the launch and we'll all share it so that, you know, if it didn't have a good market on it, we can add it for next time. Um, and these things do tend to get large and unwieldy, but they're so helpful at least, especially if you have a but. The other thing is to have a TPM buddy. So you have somebody who you can just like run your ideas by and be like, hey, am I missing anything? But have my first launch, you know, can you take, take a look at my plans and let me know if anything's like, you know, any advice. Uh, but those the two things together can sometimes help a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of templates. In this case, um, the retrospective template, I think can be helpful. We actually created one in partnership with a few tools like Coda and Mural because they're very visual and beautiful, and then you can adjust them to your own needs. Like, I, I know this motto around fail fast, and I kind of disagree with it because failing sucks, right? And nobody really wants to fail fast or slow. I like to rephrase it more as learn fast because I'm sure that both in success and failure, there's an opportunity to learn something. And it seems like based on your question, there is something unresolved. And if, if kind of we can do a retrospective, maybe yourself, but also involved in other team members, there may be some golden nuggets that can be applied for future, for the future. All right, that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> I have another follow-up question. I think uh, this was asked earlier. Um, so let's say my manager is leaving, that the person whom I report to. So what, what should be the things which I should keep in mind um, and make sure that everything is sorted before uh, that my reporting manager leaves. Uh, so he's not leaving the organization, he's moving to a different team. So uh, I just want to make sure that uh, my uh, career path and my long-term goals are intact. <clears throat> you asked a question to your current manager? 
I haven't. I have uh, set up uh, one on one with uh, with him uh, next week. But yeah, yeah, that's a, a great idea to ask um, to ask your current manager. Um, I would also just uh, when you do uh, when you do start meeting your new manager. Uh, treat it like you're starting from scratch. Don't assume that anything's been transferred over. Um, don't, don't assume that they know your goals or they know how far you've gone or what you're working on. Um, and my favorite, my favorite phrase for people who are working on promotions or anything like that is uh, talk to your new manager. You're like, great. Uh, I would love to be, I think you're already a senior PM. So maybe there's like senior two PM two or whatever, whatever your next level, next goal is whether it's a promotion or something or like something else, be like, I would love to, uh, to grow, to grow into this role. Um, what, uh, what do you think? I would love to know your advice. I'm like, what do you think I should be working on now so that I'll be ready when the opportunity comes up? So it's like very clearly, here's my target. This is what I want coming on to my side. You help me out with like, let me know all the, everything that you need so that you, that we can work together to get me this, this promotion, get me this thing that I want um, in the future. So don't, don't, you don't need to stress now. I'm not like coming at you being like, give me a promotion now. Um, but that tends to sort of get on, get on a manager's good side uh, because managers can be kind of, if you're like, I want to be promoted now, it puts them on the defensive of having to explain why you're not ready yet. But if you put it in the future, now you've like shown that you're open to, uh, to feedback and it, it really targets them on the feedback for the goal that you want. So you don't get like amorphous feedback. That's not as helpful. Yep. Makes sense. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for all your. Awesome. Great answer. So thanks, Adarsh. Uh, thanks for asking your question here. All right. So uh, yeah, I think we covered a lot of great material today. Hopefully it's helpful for new PMs and for people who want to be PMs and new PMs. So I definitely want to thank Jackie and Carlos. It's been an absolute pleasure discussing this with you today. I love all the advice you gave. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Carlos and Jackie. It was an awesome discussion. Um, I'm excited to get this video up so we can help out, you know, thousands and hopefully more PMs um, get the job and, and get better at it. <laughs>